All right, so hello everyone and welcome to A Day in the Life. I'm your host, Rachel Miles Chiacic, and today we're joined by Robert Joseph, co-founder and president. And I met Robert uh, when we both worked at Stanley Black & Decker, and I started off as an intern, and Robert always went out of his way to make sure that the interns felt comfortable and welcome and that we had just what we needed. And at the time, Robert worked as a senior data scientist and taught as adjunct faculty at Atlanta Technical College. But after I left Stanley Black & Decker, he was promoted to director of industrial strategy. And he's since moved on to create not one, but two companies, in addition to keeping his faculty position at Atlanta Technical College and teaching at Emory University. He's also a father and lifelong learner. So thank you, Robert, for taking time out of your busy schedule to chat with me. Welcome. Thank you very much. And I'm really excited to, to be here. Great. Yeah, I'm excited to have you. So just like kind of the format of the show is the first part we spend some time talking about work and then we talk about life in general. So I want to first start talking about your career journey. How did you start and what led you to where you are now? Oh, wow. So it, it's very interesting. Um, I've always been a believer of doing, you know, following your passion. And so I actually started off as a physicist when, right before I went to, to college. And I took my first course in, um, in it, was, it was physics, calculus for physicists. And this was at MIT. And so when I took that first course, I realized that I did not want to be a physicist. Uh, I wanted to do something that I thought was more practical and um, I liked building things. So I became an electrical engineer uh, and I loved it. Um, and as I progressed through electrical engineering, I ended up taking an AI course and I immediately fell in love with that aspect of sort of electrical engineering and more towards the software development into things than the, the hardware. And it was really cool because I was in this five-year bachelor's master's degree program. So I got to not only do electrical engineering and got to experience that, I was in a co-op program, so I got to experience that in a work environment. But then I also got to really decide did I want to go software or hardware. And so then I went to Carnegie Mellon and got my PhD in computer science with a minor in AI, and I loved it. And so that then had me go on towards uh, doing AI at a telephone company called US West. US West is a was a baby bell, no longer there. But I had this great experience of working with a team doing AI in when I in the time in which I say where AI was almost cool. <laughs> and so I enjoyed doing that. But then an opportunity came to move into doing more sort of software development and software um, kind of of, of building um, at US West when set-top boxes, things like the Roku and other things like that, Apple TV, were just starting to come about. Those weren't even developed yet. So this was back in the early, early 90s. And so then I started doing that and love that. So my career has gone from AI to doing development work to doing uh, um, a lot of different kinds of development, web development, desktop development, um, mobile development, and then it's done, mm -hmm. gone through a full circle, and now I'm back as a data scientist, and I've always had a passion for education, and I'm an educator, so combine those two things together, and that's where I am now. That's great. Yeah, it's funny you say like back when AI was almost cool because it's it's definitely gone through like I, I I think there was a time a while ago where it was where it was kind of big and then it didn't really go anywhere and now it's like huge and booming like it's 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 really a good field to be in. So what was how what have you seen it change? Like what was it like when you first started and 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 now? Yes, when I first started, there were. A number of really well one of the projects i worked on was a piano tutoring system that taught people how to play the piano without any human intervention and that was very successful um, and really learned a lot from that but that was also pushing the limits of what ai was able to do 
And then as things progressed and as computers got faster and people's understanding of AI got better and with uh, Jeff Hinton's really work on neural networks, that just kind of catapulted data science into what you see today. And so now with just some open source tools, meaning that anybody could access these tools, anybody could use them, you could do some pretty sophisticated AI type of things in vision and natural language processing and in other areas too. So it's just opened up the field a lot because it's brought AI to the, the doorstep of anybody that uh, has wants to spend time and effort to, to apply these techniques. It's no longer a cost thing. Yeah, yeah. And would you say that you still need to get a PhD if you want to go into the data science field or how, how would somebody get into that today? <laughs> oh, that's, that's funny. So, um, you know, I'm, I am a big believer in continuing to do education and to follow your passion. And I like school. <laughs> so I really enjoyed the whole PhD experience because when you get a PhD, it's about pushing the envelope and state-of-the-art mm -hmm. technology. And it teaches you how to really um, not be stopped by what everybody else is doing and look at how can I move the needle? And it gives you the tools in order to do that. Uh, having said that, you can get into AI. You know, there are, are people that are in, you know, high school that are doing AI stuff, in, even in, in elementary school and doing AI stuff. So there are different software packages out there and different applications out there that will allow you to participate in all different levels. So you don't have to get a PhD, uh, but for those of you that like school, I would say strongly to think about going and getting a PhD. I count myself in that number. <laughs> Yes, I always loved school and that's why I'm like, I'm thinking about PhD, but then like, there's so many people and wisely so who are like, are, are you sure you want, want to get one because it is such a time investment. And then like, is there, I mean, the, it seems like in, in the field, there's less and less of a requirement to do it. So is it for me to make more money? Not necessarily. It would be for me to just like educate myself. And, and I like what you say about it being like kind of a, playground to explore new ideas without the constraints of industry because that at now working at it's like a tech company it's like okay well we're really confined by like what we can do now or um, or at least in my field I don't work in the research division so I'm not like I don't have as much freedom to think that way so that's a very interesting point about that yeah. two other points about a PhD that I think are important for people to understand um, if you want to teach at a university then at least nowadays you need a PhD. And that opens up a whole level of, of opportunity that you might not have if you don't, don't have a PhD. The opportunity that opens up is that, you know, I've been an adjunct professor for a number of years at Atlanta Tech. And prior to that, I used to work at Strayer Universities full time. And both of those jobs I got because of my PhD. So you can do a part-time job in teaching as well as a full-time job of teaching. And you don't have to do, some universities will have the requirement of you have to do research and teach. Other universities that are more uh, teaching oriented might just say you can be an instructor and teach. And I love teaching, so that was fun. The second thing I wanna say is that once you get your PhD, you've got your PhD. There's no going back and say, oh no, you, you don't have a PhD. So it puts you at a different level of um, what people think of, of kind of your ability to solve problems. Um, and it's not necessarily that they say, oh, because you have a PhD, you can solve problems better than somebody with a master's degree. What they say is because you have a PhD, you've shown that you know how to do research and you've shown that you've you're able to take a project and move it from where it is to something that nobody else has done before and that sort of recognition sort of just by having a phd gives you some other opportunities to to go in and a little bit more lead way to explore things um, that you might not have the lead way to do otherwise 
Yeah, totally. One thing a lot of people who have or either have gotten PhDs or um, are looking or getting PhDs now are they're, they're telling me that the academic job market is shrinking so much. So do you see the future of it being where maybe you teach part time and then you also have your job or what do you what do you think about that? <laughs> So it's interesting that you should ask that because my company, Team MindShift, is about, it's a, an innovative training and technology solutions company. And we, we're starting to add an innovative training, education, and technology solutions company. But we're all about teaching. Um, and it's upskilling people that are working at companies. So there's still a need for that kind of instruction. There'll always be a need for that kind of instruction. And it's also about really changing the way that people think about learning and think about education. That's the whole uh, reason that we call our, our company Team MindShift, because it's about creating that mind shift. And with that, we're also applying uh, technology, AI technology to what we're doing. So we're not just building something, but we're pushing the envelope in how people think about technology and the technology we bring to bear on helping people to learn. So part of that is because that's the way I think. And some of that is due to having a PhD and not to say that you can't, you have to have a PhD to push the envelope. It just sort of becomes more ingrained in how you think about things. And so um, again, you don't have to have a PhD. You know, I would say follow your passion and if, but if you, and if you have a passion for getting a PhD, I would say, follow that. That'd be my advice. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And so, yeah, speaking of team mind shift, um, how did that get started? What got you interested in starting your own company? <laughs> uh, so I've been an entrepreneur since I was, as they say, knee high to a grasshopper. Uh, <laughs> I remember when I was about five or six, I Back in the olden days, there used to be matchboxes in uh, these hardcover. Um, uh, uh, yeah, the matchboxes used to be hardcover. And so I started designing these decorated matchboxes and I bought them, I think, for 10 cents for three. Of, like, I think it was 10 cents for five and I'd sell them for a nickel a piece. And so I've always had this entrepreneurial spirit and all through my career, there have been not only opportunities to do entrepreneurship, but uh, times in which I had companies or partnered with people with companies. So this was kind of a natural progression because um, I've had companies along the way. Before this, my business partner and I have known each other since undergrad. So we've known each other for uh, a number of years. And from that, we've actually been in multiple companies together. The last one before Team MindShift was Team Internet Marketing, in which we were building websites and doing all sorts of really cool stuff with the you know, internet applications. Um, and we've always had a bend towards education. And so with the change in the world uh, and a need for really you know, a focus on that the educational system is really broken and that there needs to be another way of doing things. And so that just kind of catapulted us into saying, you know, now's the time. Yeah, this is definitely a good time for innovations in the ed educational space, <laughs> especially <laughs> since, uh, you know, there's a lot more push to, to being online. So you, yep. you talked about having AI in, built into your platform. Could you talk more about that? Sure. So there are several different directions uh, that we're looking to build AI. Um, one of them is uh, just by following, uh, you know, what somebody is doing, building a profile of them, and then helping them with suggestions on what to learn next, or even presenting the next material in a unique way. Um, and so some of that came out of the work that you know, I did with the piano tuning system where, you know, piano breaks down into basically three, three things when you're first learning how to play. It's rhythm, hitting the right notes, and then phrasing or how you express yourself in music. And so uh, you first want to work on hitting the right notes. 
and then you want to work on rhythm and then you want to work on then the phrasing piece and we model this after a teacher and so as somebody goes through and does the work of playing the piano then you want to modify maybe how you present the next thing for them to do so if they're having trouble hitting the right notes then you say oh okay let's work on you know playing the right notes and let's maybe slow down the song or or have you um do a simpler piece of it or have you break it down into to different uh steps um and so we had you know remediation that or or exercises that helped with that to help to build to help to for the particular student to personalize that type of of learning and so we're starting to use some of those techniques or at least some of those concepts the the way that we use those techniques have changed because the technology has changed but the that conceptual sort of helping to guide students is is something that uh, we're we're implementing yeah definitely and like adapting to each individual's learning styles that sounds really great because i mean i know i learned way differently than somebody else <laughs> don't we all <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's really cool yeah i i've been taking some online classes and one of my complaints has been just like ah there's just all these lectures and like i i, I don't have enough reading material i like i like having kind of a mix and so yeah i think that's that's pretty cool like thinking about different ways to, del to deliver the the message yeah and it's, it's funny when you talk about online classes, one of the, the things that we we spent a lot of time on, we've developed this methodology we call EL3G, which a lot of, you know, in teaching, the story I tell all the time, in teaching math to adult learners, invariably I would have students come up to me in class and say, I'm not very good at math. And I'd say, first off, why do you want to tell me that? Um, but the second thing I would say is, though, that's not true. And I'd say, you know, uh, what's one plus one? And they'd go look at me and go, that well, that's two, that's easy math. And I'd say, well, at some point in your life, that was a very hard concept for you. So it's really not about it being easy or hard. It's about it being unknown and turning it into the known. And that's what education is all about. And so the thing that you have control over is what you tell yourself. And instead of saying, I'm not very good at math, start saying, I'm getting better at math or I'm trying hard at math because that puts you in the driver's seat and that has you in control of your education and not it over there being hard for you. And all those emotions that you're feeling, you have a choice about that. So choose the emotions that will help support you in solving your problems or support you in reaching your goals. If you want to, you can choose not to do that. But now that you know you have a choice about what you say to yourself and how you feel about it, that opens up a whole nother dimension of how to approach education. And so then you take that and then you talk about conceptual learning and people want to learn, how do I do X, Y, and Z? And that doesn't work nowadays because technology is exploding in an exponential rate. And so it's a lost proposition to try and keep up with everything on how to do something. But conceptually, if you understand what it is, how it fits in the big frame of things, big picture, and how to apply that to the problems that you have, then you could say, okay, now I know how all this works. This technology over here, I can apply to that. And this is where it fits. So we have a whole set of curriculum that talk about that. And so when I talk about sort of the technology usage, it's technology in terms of workflow. And it's also technology in terms of some of the software that we're developing and stuff like that. So. Yeah, I can see why you call it. No, I can see why you call it mind shift because that's what. Yeah, that's exactly what you said. Just, yeah. um, I I really like that because I I have been one of those people who's always said I'm not good at math, but it kind of depends on the type of math what like clicks with me. But yeah, that's a I love I love that phrasing. I wish I had learned that a long time ago. <laughs> it's never too late to apply it. Yeah, this is true. I mean, I I love learning, so I can I can say I'm getting better at math. <laughs> yes. Yes. And the the thing is that. You know, I, I say that like, oh, I'm an authority on that, but I also am human and I have negative conversations I have with myself. And so it's not that you won't have ever have negative conversations. It's that you are able to catch yourself when you are, and then in a minute, turn it around and say, you know, I'm not going to continue to tell myself that. And, and I've had people, you know, with this kind of conversation, it's changed their life. So that they, you know, people that are like, well, 
I, I'm not very good at technology. And all of a sudden we have a conversation. They're like, you know, I'm going to stop saying that. And it, it actually transformed the way that they, they look at the world. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> That's really great. Yeah. It's all like mindfulness and just in changing your perspective. I think that's that's a good life lesson in general, not just to around learning. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so let's um talk about like what a day in the life is like for you, and and how has it changed since the pandemic? Um, so it's in some ways it's changed drastically, as with everybody. In other ways, it hasn't changed that much. Uh, when you are your own entrepreneur then you are responsible for defining what your company is and growing the company and figuring out who your customers are and all of that type of stuff. And that's something that we do. And we, my business partner and I have conversations about that all the time. Um, it's funny, my business partner and I have been business partners for, I don't know, maybe 30 years, 40 years or something like that. And we, a large part of that time, we've been remote. So he's lived in another city and I've lived in the city, you know, in Atlanta. And, but we make it work. Um, so we've been, we've been virtual. We've had a virtual company for a long time. And so that's the part that, that hasn't changed that much. The other part though, that's changed with the pandemic is that we've done a number of pivots to take what we were doing already and move it into a dimension that is more um, conducive to what everybody's experienced in the pandemic. An example of that is that we are strongly focused on training and education. And we were helping people to take their training and put it online. And we added a new division that not only helps people put it online, but we'll also help them with Zoom meetings or conferences or things like that. We have a set of people that can be event managers during the event, as well as before the event, help them to set up what that event is and how, what the feeling is that they wanna have with that event. So that's some of the things that have changed are because of what the world is experiencing we've been pretty well positioned to help solve some of those problems that people have. Yeah, definitely. Like when you're already kind of remote, then it makes it not too, too dif different, but it's, it's, what do you have to do when you're like, you're, you're pivoting your company? Um, what, what goes behind those decisions and yeah, just what, what do you have yeah. to do? <laughs> so a number of things. One is really think about um, does this fit in the area in which we think, one, we have the expertise in order to provide the service? What's our unique um, uh, value that we bring to the, the, the situation? How do we, you know, differentiate ourselves from other things that are out there? And then the other thing that my partner and I really talk about is, is this something we want to do? Do we actually like that kind of product and like doing what it is that we're doing. And then the fourth thing is, uh, will this product make, make us money in, in the realm of, is it something that is a fad or is it something that is sustainable? And, and if it is, then what's the cost of doing it? What's the amount that we'll make and our you know, financial projections. So all of those things go into to that decision. Definitely. Yeah. And I can especially see the point of like, okay, this is something I'm doing on my own. I hope I like, you know, like I want to make sure you like doing it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I started this thing. I should enjoy it. <laughs> you know, life is too short and there's so much opportunity out there. So many opportunities out there, you know, the, follow your passion. And it's not blindly follow your passion like, oh, I'm going to be an artist, so I'm just going to draw, 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 or whatever that is. But I think you want to follow your passion as well as, you know, put food on the table. Mm -hmm. So figure out how you can do the things that you like doing and do it so that it services you in all the ways that it needs to. For sure, yeah. 
So what do you do outside of work to decompress? <laughs> um, I have a lot of different hobbies. You know, I say follow your passion. Um, I will pick up something and if I like it, I'll start to investigate it more and kind of go for it. So, you know, it's so funny uh, about, I guess a few months ago, I got into puzzles <laughs> you know? and uh, I got a puzzle and I put it together and then I put another puzzle together. And then I, I put puzzles together with friends and I put puzzles together with my kids. So that's one of the things that I find that it really helps to release my mind. Um, I used to swim. Um, that was another thing that I would do for fun. Um, and I'm going to start back swimming in a little while, just with everything going on, you know, gyms have shut down and I'm still trying to, to, as everybody is navigate their way through this new Delta variant and, uh, and, and on. Um, I also like to, uh, watch movies and I also like to travel, uh, again, travel has kind of been put on hold hold because of of uh what's going on um so yeah those are the things and oh audiobooks um i i'm a big sci-fi fan uh and a self-help books and so i'll listen to those while i might walk or while i might uh you know do a stationary bike or something like that so nice yeah combining that with work with like with movement Sounds, yeah. yeah, definitely a good thing. I like to do that too. I, I enjoy audiobooks as well, or maybe like a podcast or something, but um, yeah. Uh, and how do you keep up with like the, the latest technology trends? Wow. Uh, so keeping up with the latest technology trends, I tend to be opportunistic about it. So there are a number of things that we're trying to do. And that's when I'll dive deep into, okay, what technology is out there that will support what it is that we're trying to do. So that's one way of doing it. The other way is that subscribing to a number of different meetup groups as well as other uh, organizations allows me to stay abreast of what's going on. And then the third is actually talking with people. <laughs> you know? If you really stop and listen to people, you'll get a lot of information and it'll give you an insight into how they think about things, what they're thinking about, and then also continuing to improve your, your understanding of things too. So for example, uh, you said you like to do audiobooks. What's a, what's a good audiobook that you, you've listened to that you're like, oh yeah, be a good audiobook to listen to? Oh yeah, that's funny because like a good audiobook is like, like it could be a good book, but not a good audio book because sometimes audiobooks have somebody who sounds like a robot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so like uh, my husband is actually listening to this book and he kept telling me about how much I would enjoy it. But then I heard the book and I'm like, this sounds like a robot. I just want to buy the regular book and read it. Like, <laughs> um, so I, I always enjoy like the, my favorite audio books or like, I guess are are often, I mean, I, I still have to enjoy the book because you can have a great narrator, but maybe not a good book. But like, I, I guess my favorites are the ones where like they, they kind of, they, they sound like they're enjoying what they're doing. They're enjoying their, their reading. They, they bring different voices to the characters or, so I guess my, my all-time favorite has been like the, the two different narrators for the Harry Potter books, which is like Jim Dale. And then in the British version is Stephen Fry. And they both like are very different, but both do a very good job. And I, I'm a big Harry Potter fan. So that's it's just like ah. what I can think of off the top of my head but um yeah other other I, I can't think of like some audiobook that's just wowed me lately but like from a narration perspective and that might not have even been what you were asking but that's no, just what it, I think of with audiobooks <laughs> that's that's fine so what I took from that is that you really are you care about the story and you care about the narration and you care about the picture that the narrator paints. Um, and so that's uh, some insight that I got that I didn't have before. Because when I listen to an audiobook, I listen to an audiobook from the standpoint of more so the story and the narration has to be 
pretty good, but it doesn't have to be like, it doesn't have to necessarily paint the picture as much. But again, that's the thing that, that I find fascinating is that when I talk with other people and I understand their perspective, it gives me some new insights on how to look at things. Because I, if you ask me what my favorite book was, I would look at more what is the book that I really liked the story behind or that I really got something out of and not so much the, the, the narration. So that's, yeah, that's how I stay up on technology. <laughs> yeah. Well, and sci-fi is a really great one for that too, because I mean, the more and more you hear about latest technology trends, the more sci-fi it sounds. <laughs> and so it can, it can, it's like, it's becoming more of a reality. And now I'm kind of curious to see where sci-fi is going to go now to push the envelope because like what we, what traditional sci-fi has been is becoming more and more of a reality. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, so another kind of like just general question I have is um, since you're since you're a parent and um, you have all of these like amazing like career uh, goals and accomplishments that you've had. So how have you been able to, to balance that? Uh, so families first. And I really try and be with my kids um, if they're having events try and participate in those events. And I remember that when they were younger, they took, they were taking Taekwondo. And so I also joined the, the Taekwondo group and I would train with, with them, although they were much, much better than me, but I would get that time with them. And so it's really, you know, making the time to, to balance it all. And it's something that you really do have to, well, you want to plan for. And you make it as part of the priority as you make everything else. And that's the, the thing that is, um, I think it's helped me to really be with my kids. Uh, and we have a great relationship. Um, my oldest son is now, off to college and we, we talk from time to time and I miss him and he misses me. And my youngest son is in the is senior in high school going, you know, rising senior. And we, we talk not as much because he's, he is, you know, a lot of stuff going on, you know, the junior senior years when, and he's involved in a lot of other activities too. Um, but I try and go to, he was doing mock trial and I saw his mock trials on, and they were online. So that was really cool. And so I just, you know, just fit it in, put it on the schedule, like, just like everything else. Yeah. Fit it on the schedule and prioritize it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah I'm, I mean, you might've already said it, but like, what is like kind of the most challenging about how, maintaining that balance? Would you say? I think the most challenging thing uh, is when there are, you know, the, the uh, conflicting um, time slots, the battle for a time slot. So my kids are doing something this time and then that most important client is, is the only time they have is that time. So how do you sort of balance that? Um, and so part of balancing that is when I put the kids stuff on the calendar, I call that place sacred. And so, you know, I don't schedule things at that time frame. Now, there are exceptions to that rule as well as exceptions to things that I've scheduled with other people that, you know, sometimes that get superseded by my kids too. But it's a matter of, of really valuing that time frame as well as being open and with communication with you know everybody involved so i've you know talked with people before where i've had a scheduling conflict with my kids and i'd say look my kids are doing this and they're very important to me and you know wh what are people going to say there no 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 i'm more important than your kids so it really is about having that that conversation with people too and not being afraid to you know it's like you know you are very important to me and 
my kids are very important too. Is there another time that could work that's not that time? If, if it boils down to that. Other, and that's not a conversation I have all the time. It, the conversation I have usually is that uh, these are the times I'm available. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's a good point about just, just being willing and, and open to talk about that because I think some people are afraid to. And um, But yeah, who is going to say, like, I'm more important than your kids? <laughs> <laughs> and if somebody says that, then maybe maybe that's not the person that you want to want to work with. Yeah. Maybe not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So on, on the flip side of that, like, what's been the most rewarding about um, keeping that that balance? and prioritization of your kids that I get to see my kids grow up and that's been such a wonderful experience I, you know I remember holding them in my hand when they're just a little bitty kid and people would say you know that time's valuable you know you, you, you know treasure that time it goes by fast and being on the other side where they're now uh, adults in you know uh, and close to adulthood it's like wow they were right in the sense that I'll, you remember back when they were little um, and you can't get that time back. And it, it can seem like it's fast and it could also seem like, you know, are we there yet? <laughs> you <know? laughs> are you ready to be out on your own and not have me foot the bill <laughs> type of thing? <laughs> um, so, you know, and it, there's nothing wrong with that, but it, it's just funny to, to, to look at it from sort of multiple, uh, multiple perspectives. Um, but that's been the, that's been the, the funnest thing is just watching them, watching them grow up and, and come into their own. And each, each, I have two, two sons, um, 17 and 18, or 17 and 19, actually. Um, and they are each got their own personalities they have some similarities but they also have some differences and watching them to just find their way in life and being adults is really cool yeah become their own people <laughs> yep yeah yeah that is really special so uh i was doing some linkedin snooping when i was preparing for this call and i saw uh -huh. that you do a lot of volunteering. So um, in addition, and, and you also do a lot of teaching. So what kind of, what calls you to, to do that? I really believe in helping to people to reach their potential. And it, the volunteering I do, I, I love talking with, with organizations or kids or adults or are at conferences because I get, a lot out of it as well as hopefully give them a lot so that's part of what calls me to do that the other part is that i have been very fortunate to have people support me and help me throughout my life and i want to be there to help and support other people too so yeah i can relate to that i uh volunteered with my company to to uh, to talk to some uh soon to be graduate students at Berkeley or they're about to graduate not like grad school but graduating like soon to be actually graduating from Berkeley about like just what do we do at my company and everything and and I was like oh this is going to be so exhausting because I'm kind of an introvert and then I realized wow I actually like had a lot to say and I felt like I was like I actually had things that people were finding interesting and so I I can definitely like see that because I have definitely benefited a lot from from other people and I'm kind of getting to that point where I'm like oh okay actually maybe some of my insights can be <laughs> valuable too I can definitely see that yeah well they are valuable <laughs> so yeah I think just like when you're kind of like I guess getting started in your career you're like well I'm still, I have no idea what's going on but then I, I I realized that being an early career professional was actually really what a lot of the the, the graduates like almost like the the seniors were, were, were looking for because that's where they were going to be as an early professional so it was actually a pretty good experience <laughs> yeah the other thing too is that you've stepped in a, a few landmines. So <laughs> you can say, you know, over there, you might not want to walk because <laughs> this has been my experience. So. Yeah, no, that's a good point too. Yeah, try to try to help people <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> from committing those mistakes. <laughs> yep, absolutely. 
Yeah, um, I guess kind of my last question is just about Atlanta in general. So you're in Atlanta and I was kind of curious to know like how long you've been in Atlanta and what's made you stay in Atlanta? I've been in Atlanta since I guess the uh, late 90s uh, after the Olympics uh, was here. Uh, and I, it's really for me centrally located to the places that I want. Um, I've got family in Pensacola, Florida. That's where I grew up. Uh, it's got a, a great airport to be able to get to pretty much anywhere in the world pretty easily. There are a lot of direct flights. And it's got a really good ecosystem for the kinds of things that, uh, for startups and the kinds of things that I'm interested in. Um, it's got enough of a culture that you can go and see a play or you can go and see you know comedy or musicians or you know a lot of good concerts come through here so i like it from that standpoint um it also has it doesn't have the hustle and bustle like a new york or you know or you know san francisco although you know it's starting to <laughs> starting to get pretty crowded here so uh but yeah i like it it's it's home for now yeah definitely so thanks for coming on robert um if people want to find out more information about team mindshift or any of the other things where they're working on where should where should they go oh they can go to teammindshift.com that's our website mm -hmm. And then um, my LinkedIn is, I think, LinkedIn slash J slash Dr. Robert Joseph, and they can go there um, to connect with me. And if people, I love to connect with people, uh, please connect with me. Tell me you saw, saw me on the podcast and uh, I, you know, and I, if I can do anything to, to help or provide any advice, um, please, please ask. And uh, I'm, I'm here to help people. Awesome. I will put this in the, the description on, on the show notes as well. So awesome. For people. Well, thanks for being on. It was really great chatting with you and lots of things to think about. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, it's good to see you and see you continue to grow in your career and blossom. And I think it's a great idea for the podcast and I wish it much, much success. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss a single show. Interested in being on the show? Know someone that might be a good fit? Use the nomination form in the description.